This is a message for everyone, and I mean everyone. You mean everyone? Everyone! We are all different, and we all face different problems. But on a more fundamental level, we all face the same basic problem. We are ruled by criminals. No one should have the right to rule over others, and when such a power exists, it is inevitable that the worst of us will gravitate to these positions of power. Power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. So the nation's sanity has a very simple solution. Remove that power. We ask all good people to unite and join us in demanding that the non-aggression principle be established as the law through our three-part peace agreement so that we can create a truly free society. For those who don't know, the non-aggression principle is a principle that basically defines crime by whether or not you are causing harm or loss to another, or at least threatening or attempting to. It is not a pacifist principle, and it does allow for the use of force, both for self-defence and the defence of others, but it strictly forbids the initiation of force against peaceful people. Establishing this principle as the terms of peace, a law that is universally applied, would give us true equal rights and freedom for all.
My fellow sheep, election season is upon us. Are you one of the 12% of Americans who still approves of our government? Then we need your help to force the other 88% into compliance. Our democracy depends on it. We're an organization called Citizens Against Too Much Unfettered Freedom, or CATMUF. CATMUF is a bipartisan flock of sheep whose goal is expanding government until nothing else remains. Because the government is here to help you. How can you help CATMUF help you? By only voting for candidates dedicated to expanding government. It's easy. You don't need to study the issues. No matter what a politician says when running for office, they're all dedicated to expanding government. And make sure you tell all your friends and family to vote for more government. Here at CATMUF, we don't care if you vote Democrat or Republican, as long as you vote for candidates committed to growing our federal family. CATMUF, because folks just aren't smart enough to handle real freedom. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on theconsciousresistance.com and solpodcast.org. So today I'm delighted to have Matt Sands, who comes in from south- southern England. He's a voluntarist, and he's the founder of nationsofsanity.com. And you can find him on uh, his Facebook page, Nation- Nations of Sanity, and uh, he's on Twitter, at Nations of Sanity. And we're going to talk about what Nations of Sanity is in a moment. And we're going to discuss, of course, his path to volunteerism and uh, what um, authors, books, personalities influenced him along the way. So, And, of course, what is Nations of Sanity? And what what does he have, uh, what disagreements does he have with the approach that most volunteers take towards um, achieving a voluntary society? So, uh, Matt, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you for taking the time. Yeah, no problem. You messaged me a while ago and uh, showed me some of your uh, some of your content and your website and your YouTube channel. I checked it out. Thought it was very interesting and fascinating. You know, um, you know, I like it that a lot of us have unique perspectives on you know you know like like all of us we mostly agree on the philosophy so philosophical part, right? But then I guess the application, like let's say you know Adam Kokesh thinks. He, running for president, or as he says, non-president, is the way. And some people say, no, that's not the way. That's completely counterproductive. And you know, and and um, you know, maybe other people, you know, do it through business ideas or just you know, podcasts and YouTube channels. And and so you have this idea of nations of sanity. So so yeah, um, I think it's wonderful that we're all um, so diverse and we can have a wonderful conversation. You know, about what how we think the best way to um, you know. Achieve a voluntary society and absolve the state. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah. So, please, before we get into that, um, if you can go go through your path to volunteerism and uh, and what led you to this place. Um. Well, uh, I suppose in, in in a lot of ways, I kind of feel like I've always been a voluntarist, um, even before I was familiar with the term, and even before I was familiar with the term non-aggression principle, but. I suppose I'd have to credit. I suppose I'd have to credit probably Stefan Molyneux for actually making me aware of the term non-aggression principle, uh, even though I agree with him on almost nothing now. But um, <laughs> when he, when I first sort of uh, came across the concept of sort of, you know, libertarianism and, and anarchism and ultimately voluntarism um, and the non-aggression principle itself um, obviously I was already familiar with the concepts because the non-aggression principle is a concept that most people are familiar with they just don't know it as the non-aggression principle but the basic concept of you know don't harm others and don't initiate force on peaceful people is something that most people when you explain it to them they just like oh yeah well you know that's that's a lesson I learned at four or five years old you know it's <laughs> it's a relatively simple concept that most people are familiar with mm. um but i hadn't heard the term and it was it was it was nice in a way to hear something like that encapsulated into a term because i do think that it is you know strikes at the root of what's wrong with the world the fact that the non-aggression principle is violated on a regular basis um so it's nice to have a term that you can refer to when you're talking about this principle um so yeah that's probably kind of what got me here um, I just kind of slowly became more familiar with other people that were sort of speaking about libertarianism and um, 
and uh, things like property rights and stuff like that. And uh, so, what, yeah, what, what yeah. were the other people that influenced you after after Stefan on you? Well, um, to be honest with you, it's, it's difficult because, I mean, Stefan Molyneux, like I said, I definitely have to credit him with making me aware of, of, of these kind of ideologies and this kind of movement and stuff. Um, but it wasn't long before I found myself, I mean, he's taken a bit of a nosedive in my opinion, and mm. I don't want to spend too much time talking about him, but, right, right, right. you know, I don't think he really represents voluntarism anymore, but he was the person who sort of brought me onto it. And then I kind of became aware of people like Walter Block. Right. Um, who who makes some great arguments, and even people that aren't necessarily voluntarists, but perhaps started some of um, some of the um, concepts with regards to libertarianism, like Milton Friedman and mm. uh, Thomas Sowell, who who aren't even really libertarians; they're mainly just right. conservative, right, like right. consistent conservatives, but yeah. but would still making some of the arguments that voluntarists would make with right. regards to you know state violence and the immorality of taxation. Mm. Um, my problem with conservatives is they are very selective in their uh, uh, approach to liberty, if you like. You know, it's they're they're against taxation when it's for one thing, but not when it's for another. And you know, but um, but yeah, I, I I suppose really I kind of it was from watching. I'd have to say it was mainly from watching Stefan Molyneux that the Nations of Sanity idea came about because it it seemed like once you come to this sort of you know, uh, realization with the principles and you come to the idea of, yeah, the non-aggression principle and, and, and taxation is theft and all these things that just come together when you apply the non-aggression principle consistent, consistently to society and you realize what's wrong with the world. The next obvious step for me was, okay, so what do we do about it? You know, what, what needs to be done? What's mm. what we know we can kind of identify the problem um, so what's the solution? And for me, the logical next step, and that's obviously what the nation's of sanity is representing, is the non-aggression principle represents crime in, I would argue, an objective way. Um, it's a universal standard of morality, and it defines crime in a way that's got a logical consistency. So if the non-aggression principle defines crime, and, and even anarchists and voluntarists seem to agree on that, the next logical step for me is that it should be the law. Um, and when I started thinking about the implications of that, I've, I realized that if you applied the non-aggression principle as law, because at first, as coming at it from an anarchist point of view, the idea of law seems wrong, seems counterproductive. But that's because we only know law as something that's laid down by our rulers. And obviously right. having rulers is against right. anarchist principles. Right. But... That's not. That doesn't have to be what law is. Another way you can establish law is through a peace agreement. So the law would be essentially like the terms of peace, because that's what a law is. It's basically saying if you break this law, the peace is broken and force will be used against you. Other than that, you know, we all have an agreement to be at peace with each other. So the law is the terms of peace. So you don't need a ruling entity to have law. You just need a peace agreement where everyone agrees what the the, the line is that where if people cross that line, that's when force is used against them. But other than that, everyone should be free to live how they want. And uh, then when I came to that realization, the next sort of snag, the, the next sort of flaw that came out was, OK, that's all very well and good in principle. But then when you actually try to apply that to the real world with real people, as objective as the non-aggression principle is as a principle, there are still certain gray areas and areas where precise parameters you could you could argue over where to draw certain parameters um, so like just to give for an example, we can all agree that a competent adult has full self ownership of themselves should be able to make their own decisions with regards to sex and drugs and and legal contracts um, and I think most of us also agree that a child cannot consent to these things and obviously although they're protected by the non-aggression principle with regards to harm or loss they don't have the full self-ownership of a of a of a, of a mo they don't have the moral agency mm. to take on the responsibility of the full freedom that the non-aggression principle would give to a competent adult so we can be agreed on that and then and and agreeing on the non-aggression principle as law would would obviously set that but 
exactly agreeing when a vulnerable child becomes a competent adult, you know, whether you're setting age, whether you're also including perhaps a competency test, you know, um, because the standard we would apply to children, we, we might also apply to adults that were, say, mentally handicapped or something like that. Mm. So, you know, so the, the principle's clear, but exactly where you draw the line isn't always an objective, definite thing. So then I thought, okay, so it's not enough to just say, let's have one peace agreement that establishes the non aggression principles law, because you're still leaving this grey area, and that grey area alone could still... Could, first of all, it could infect the black and white and people could stretch interpretation to the point of meaninglessness, you know, where they're encroaching into absurdity. Mm. Um, so I thought, well, what you then need to do. So it's not enough to agree to have the non-aggression principle as law. You also need to agree. If you're not agreeing on the exact standard, you need to agree on the limits of tolerance with regards to different interpretations, separating the grey area from the black and white. So just to use the example with regards to age of consent when a child becomes an adult and when that transition occurs, let's say, for example, that reasonable people, I mean, and I say it might include a competency test, but let's just talk about the age thing. Let's just say reasonable people might have reasonable disagreements over whether it's 19 years old or it should be 18 years old or should it be 17 years old. That's fine, but no reasonable person can say that a three-year-old is an adult or that a 40-year-old is a child mm. to use obvious extremes. Mm. And all you do, is you bring those extremes in to a point of sanity, and that's why it's called the nations of sanity, because we're just creating sane standards when it comes to these grey areas and, and basically saying, OK, reasonable people can disagree, but there's a limit to that disagreement. And... Let's just say it was like 14 to 21, for example, was like the international standard if you established the non-aggression principle as, as law. It may be like 12 to 21 to, to account for perhaps tribal people that have adulthood at a very early age or something like that. But I don't know. But you have limits because there's got to be a limit. Otherwise, you don't have a standard. You know, mm. people can just stretch it to ridiculousness. So you've got to have a limit. And I think reasonable people can find limits of tolerance. And then within that, people can voluntarily associate based on their more specific. So, for example, let's say the, the age range was 14 to 21 based on the international agreement of this peace agreement, which is like law. You can still have societies that say, well, we don't really want to associate with people that consider a 14-year-old to be an adult. That offends our sensibilities or whatever. Mm. That's fine. They can voluntarily associate, you know, whether it's on a societal level or a neighborhood level, you know, whatever kind of level they want, as long as it's always voluntary and they're not infringing on other people. They can have their own societies where anyone that's part of that society agrees the age of consent is 18, if that's, you know, what they think. Right. But they're not going to go to war with people mm -hmm. that have different ages of consent until it gets over those limits, until it goes crosses those lines which are the limits of tolerance that separate the gray area from the black and white. That yeah. <laughs> so we were, we were discussing before we were recording about why you don't consider yourself a, a, an anarcho capitalist. Right. And, and you said that, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you said that your goal is to establish a, a voluntary society free of coercion. You know, however people wish to live under that, you know, gen general model is fine, right? If they do want to establish, a, you know, a worker-owned co-op or a commune or, you know, a factory or, you know, whatever, or a city, a metropolis, you know, as long as it's voluntary, that's the whole, that's the whole idea. That's the whole uh, basis, the foundation for it. And I definitely agree with that. And, um, you know, I used to... Um, you know, poke fun and jab at communists, especially anarcho-communists. Um, but I, w I was put in my place, though. So I remember one Facebook post and a lot of anarcho-communists that are very peaceful and that are very intelligent, um, rightfully so, corrected me and said, well, um, you know, you're not being consistent. You know, you, you, have to, you have to be tolerant of people who don't wish to live in your capitalist model. And that made sense to me. Um, you know, if people wish to live like that, sure, fine, go ahead. You know, as long as it's peaceful, as long as it's voluntary. And and so, yeah, that's, um, you know, I, I enjoy that. And so, yeah, I, I also, um, yeah, I like the word term voluntarist as well for that reason. And so what it seems to me what you're talking about 
are basically yeah you know, voluntary societies or intentional communities or you can even say kind of like eco villages i guess something like that where people have this general agreement about how they want to live right and and so and so that's that's awesome that's cool you know and and also this term if you heard of this term panarchy which is basically like you know all inclusive of you know anarchism i guess again very basic uh word basically means just a person who doesn't want to have any rulers controlling them and dictating how they should live right and so a person can live in many ways and be an anarchist right be an anarchist so so um yeah so the idea of panarchy is that many there's many different ways to live under anarchism right and so that's that's uh i also like that term um and also you also reminded me of a few books that i read that discuss this sort of thing. Uh, I'm curious if you read them as well. One of them is called um, The Market for Liberty, Linda Morris Tannehill. Have you heard about that one? Great, wonderful book. I think it was written in the 1970s, but completely um, um, applicable to today because these these ideas are timeless, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I definitely recommend check that book out that was an awesome book when i read i actually read it twice i i very rarely read a book twice but i read that book twice and it's amazing really amazing uh, basically talking about how a voluntary society would work how would defense work without the state how would i don't know whatever work without the state you know uh security work how would you know um you know and pick, pick your pick your genre and how would that work and uh, it's really fascinating the i the um possibilities you know that arise and then there's also another uh shorter book called the Nonviolent zone um that also discussed that possibilities of how you know how how um courts adjudication might work without the state you know how would law work without the state how would you know <clears throat> um yeah many different things again so security private security <clears throat> um and then there's uh, you remind me of this uh, channel man against the state i don't know if you've heard of this channel um i think he's a british guy he sounds british and um and he has um, a couple of videos, like a short video series called Law Without Government. And so he first video is like principles and it's like application and, you know, the ideas of how would law develop without the state, which to most people sounds contradictory, right? Mm -hmm. Because they associate law with the state. And, and so as, as volunteers and anarchists, that's one of the challenges we have is to, is to try to help people divorce that idea in them that that law only comes from centralized institutions, right? Mm. And that courts, you know, you know, uh, the people who, who resolve disputes only, you know, work for the state, right? So <laughs> these are some of the challenges. So, so yeah, uh, have you heard of those books or that, or that uh, YouTube channel? No, I haven't. Had yeah. Any of those yeah. So that, that's along the same. So it seems like, it seems like you developed these ideas pretty much independently, of like like you you weren't influenced by um a book or anything like that that you read no not really i mean even, to be honest even when i came across stefan molyneux he was only really giving me a name for things i already believed in if you cool. know what i mean with regards to the non-aggression i mean yeah. funny enough i always I always used to say i didn't necessarily stretch out to the implications of over you know of getting rid of government and, and taxation and because i didn't like most people i didn't have that thought process of really right. thinking on that level all the time but one thing that i always thought and one thing that never made sense to me were laws that were in place when no one was being harmed by another per you know like where there was that the whole no victim no crime like yeah. things like drug laws obviously right, right. being an obvious example right. but like gambling laws as well and stuff like that i never understood yeah. how people could be deemed a criminal right. when they're not hurting anyone that just that immediately always, and I, and I've always had that kind of attitude of, well, if you're not hurting anyone, then you shouldn't be considered a criminal. You shouldn't be right. considered committing a crime. That, yeah. For me, that's just basic logic, you know. Um, <laughs> and like I say, then when I come across the non-aggression principle, that's when I realise, oh, there's actually a term for that <laughs> way of thinking. There's actually, oh, and then when you suddenly start applying it consistently, and you look at taxation, and you look at government even as as a whole you realize that, well, governments almost by definition are violations of the non-aggression principle simply because they're ruling entities. Yeah, well, yeah um, go, go ahead, go ahead. No, sorry. Um, um, okay, so, I, yeah, you also remind me of um, one of my friends who, Facebook friends, um, and I was also doing some podcasts with him as well. I don't know if you're familiar, familiar with him, Jim Limber Davis, and his he wrote a book, uh, two books, Liberty Defined and Morality Defined, and he also has a, 
uh, I think a YouTube channel, Liberty Defined. And and, and what's, what reminds me of him is that he didn't read many books to get these ideas. Um, on the contrary, he, you know, I guess he kind of stumbled upon the philosophy a little bit, but then the rest of it, he kind of reasoned out for himself and he came to his own conclusions independently, which is amazing. And it sounds like what you did, you kind of reasoned these things out logically in your head and you came to your own conclusions, um, which is awesome. You know, uh, it, it's, it's so, it's so amazing when I, when I hear that idea that, you know, people in, in, you know, s- different parts of the world, you know, reason things out and come to similar conclusions <laughs> without ever <laughs> communicating or meeting. And then you're like, wait, other people think like this, <laughs> right? Is that, I find that to be pretty amazing. Yeah, I, th- I think there's a, I do think there's a universal, a universality to the, to the yeah. principle that, that, yeah, though it is surprising in some ways, but in other ways it's not surprising because even my initial resistance to the idea of things like taxation is theft even that wasn't based on any real logic. I mm. kind of immediately knew that taxation was theft because I was like, well, yeah, theft is taking against someone's will and taxation is taken against your will. You know, yeah, there yeah. wasn't really any argument to be had. Yeah. But the initial resistance that I had, which is, which is probably the resistance most people have, is thinking about the implications of not having tax and, oh, well, how would society run? And, the, and then your brain automatically goes to the utilitarian argument before you even consider the principle. And sometimes the utilitarian argument isn't how you think it is. But I, I like to deal with the principle first and then see how it applies because right and wrong comes first and then how well we can apply that apply that comes sort of second a bit for me, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. And and um, I mean, I, I make the common analogy of um, of uh, ch- uh, chain slavery, you know, when people, you know, abolitionists at the time were saying, you know, we shouldn't have slavery because owning humans is immoral, you know, uh, enslaving humans is immoral. And then people say, well, how would the cotton be picked? And, and they're like, I don't care. <laughs> we're going to figure <laughs> it out. I just know that owning humans is immoral. And I'm sure we're smart enough to find a better way to organize our society. <laughs> exactly. Go, exactly. Go, ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say well, another example, like a modern day example that infuriates me is like when I've heard about like the legalization of cannabis debate and I right. hear about people arguing for it because of all the taxes that could be raised, you know, like, oh, look how good it would be for our economy and all of this. And (laughs) that just infuriates me as an argument because I'm thinking, well, first of all, fuck taxes. Sorry. First of all, (laughs) forget about taxes. Sorry. I mean, to swear. Sorry. Um, But secondly, um, you know, even forgetting about the taxes side of it, the economic issues is, is not even part of the conversation. It's wrong to criminalize it. Even before you get into the subject about medicinal use and all that, which is a very compelling argument in of itself. Yeah. But before you even think about any of that, the basic, pr- it shouldn't in a, in a sane society, in my opinion, it shouldn't even be part of the conversation. It shouldn't even be considered that you could have a drug law. Hmm. The idea of criminalizing someone for what they put in their own body is just absurd on the face of it. And it should, it should have been dismissed as soon as someone ever mentioned it. But yeah, when you live in a society that's already got the absurdities of a state and taxation and stuff like that, adding things like drug laws and adding other violations of freedom which come along the way, they become inevitable because the system's rotten to the core and that corruption just spreads and compromises everything moving forward. So if you're if you're against uh, uh, drug laws, I assume you're okay with uh, bans on straws? <laughs> <laughs> Pro- prohibition on straws. Have you heard about this? Plastic straws are prohibited in in parts of California. Have you heard about this? <laughs> prohibited, banned? Like like I saw a funny meme. It's like you know you see a picture of um, you know a table has got like lines of cocaine and a razor blade, and then you see plastic straws, and it's like quick, the cops are here. Hide the straws. <laughs> <laughs> Is is that was that from an environmental? Uh... Yes, yes, environment because of you know straws are harming the environment and these animals, you know that kind of. I stuff. tell you what, I will at least say give give them credit for one thing. At least they're working on a principle of harm, right? It, it, you know, like at least a, a, at least from a principle of doing harm to others. At least they're at least considering it from that point of view. Because the thing that frustrates me about 
like things like drug laws and stuff is you, you can't even make an argument that you're harming you know, even if you say the drug's really damaging to you and it even talks about the effects on society and all that the fact of the matter is is if you wanted to drink bleach you should be allowed to <laughs> if you're doing it to yourself right. but I should you have know, the, if... the damn right to drink my bleach okay good <laughs> <laughs> but you no, know don't I, smack I, that I know bleach out of my hand okay good <laughs> I know it sounds absurd, but at the same time, that's what freedom is. That's right. what self ownership is, and right. it's the freedom right. to make bad decisions as yeah. well as good. Oh, you yeah. know, it doesn't even. It's like, I mean, one of the things I liked when I spoke to to Daniel when he was talking about, um, and, and when you spoke to him as well on your podcast, Daniel Scott, when he was saying about how he used to be obviously for um, cannabis laws and mm. you know voted against legalization in his past and stuff like that. Mm. Um, but one of the things that I liked about it is his his realization didn't come out of any affection for the drug. It came out of a realization of the principle, the basic immorality. And it didn't matter how harmful the drug is or isn't. And it didn't matter about the other considerations because the basic principle that you that it is, as I say, insane to criminalize people for what they choose to put in their own body or do to their own body. Mm that's their business that's what self-ownership is and i think once we take a consistent approach to that everything else kind of falls into place as you go along yeah i'd like to describe democracy or representative democracy as being um a population of many dictators many many dictators because everybody you know through via the state and politicians attempt to control their neighbor in what their neighbor can and cannot do right through the ballot box and and um, you know, actually, I was I was at a a, f um, a friend's um, party barbecue recently, and and the topic of voting came up, and they said, "You don't vote, what?" And I said, "Yeah, you know, I I would rather not impose my will, my opinion, on other people via the state by force. You know, how about how about this? How about instead of using the state to force your will upon others?" How about you talk to your neighbor? How about you go and you knock on your neighbor's door and you start a conversation? How about that? Can you do that rather than whipping out the guns? Or why don't you, you know, I don't know, open a YouTube channel or a podcast and just start trying to start a conversation, spread ideas. Stop using violence, please. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, do we really need to say this out in the open? Is it, is it really uh, that confused and muddled, you know, of an ideology that then, and, and that is the problem, right? People don't, make the connection that the state is violence, that anything the state does, you know, utilizes violence and force. That's, that's one of the primary disconnects, right, that, that we have to help people um, be made aware of. Yeah, and I think, I think also people have a problem divorcing things that the state does, because, like, not everything the state does is necessarily bad in regards to, you know, they do provide services that on, the, that on their own as services aren't bad things. Right, it's right. bad that they rob us to do it and, right. and do it through their corruptive ways and all the bureaucracy and everything else. But, mm. you know, it's not necessarily bad, for example. And it may, you know, some people, I know people disagree with, like, for example, welfare on other moral issues. Mm. But it's not necessarily wrong to provide for people that can't provide for themselves. No. It's not wrong to provide healthcare for people that can't provide for themselves. The wrong part is when someone's putting a gun to your head and forcing you to contribute to such things. And the, the idea that if the, the idea that we shouldn't be forced into these things isn't the same as the idea is that we shouldn't have these things. Exactly. Um, <laughs> and it's, you know, we, we still want to educate our children, mm. but we don't want taxation because, cause, I mean, apart from the, obviously the utilitarian arguments, if you don't get an end good product when you're dealing with stolen money because there's no incentive to provide a good service. <laughs> right. But even without that, again, that's a utilitarian argument. The initial principle, it's just wrong. It's wrong to steal from people. Right. And simple as that. And we can still, I just, I, I mean, I honestly think that we can create such a better world voluntarily than right. we ever could with a gun pointed to our head, you know, in, in almost all aspects of life. Um, but I do think that the key, and this is where the disconnect, I think, comes from with, with, with almost all people, and even some people that have embraced anarchism, is just because we shouldn't have the right to rule people doesn't mean we can't serve them. 
And the beauty of the non-aggression principle is you can enforce the non-aggression principle as a law, which is you know, why I think it should be the law. You can enforce the non-aggression principle as a law without violating it, without initiating force, without exercising any rule over anybody else, without violating their freedom. I mean, I once had an argument with a person who insisted that even those laws were a violation of his freedom. And I, I said, and I used a real extreme example. I'm saying, well, let's just pick rape, for example. Are you saying that a law against rape is a violation of your freedom? And he was like saying, yeah. And I was like, well, how can you make that argument? Freedom doesn't include the right to rape. He's like, well, yeah, but you're still telling me I can't do it. I was like, yeah, I'm only telling you you can't <laughs> harm people. Right. You know, like, basically, I'm, you know, the only way I think someone could argue that you're violating their freedom by enforcing the non-aggression principle as law is if they are genuinely and legitimately making the argument that freedom includes the right to rob, rape, murder and steal and 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 and, and violate people in whatever way mm. if you if you think that freedom is the right to do whatever you want as long as you don't harm others which is what i think freedom is defined as then the non-aggression principle doesn't violate your freedom and i don't really care about the perceived freedom of rapists murderers and thieves so <laughs> if they do want to play some kind of mental gymnastic game in their own head where they're somehow being oppressed because we're going to use force in a united <laughs> effort to stop them from you know doing right. things like that right. then that i mean and again this is what harkens back to the name of nations of sanity because it's about it's about sanity people can have real absurd arguments where they say oh, well, you are violating my freedom by not letting me rape and murder and rob. You know, people can take things to absurdity, but that's not a sane way of looking at it. And if you have a sane, logical approach to it, then it's, it's self, it beca everything becomes self-evident. Of course, you can't harm others. Of course, freedom should end at that point. But that it's still freedom if it ends at that point, just because it ends at the point where you're in... Because that freedom is the only freedom that everyone can have. If freedom went beyond that point, then everyone can't have it because the victims of those crimes aren't ha having the same freedom as the people that are, are committing them. So right. that's why freedom needs to be stopped there. And that's why drawing that line is so important. And then I harken back to the basic premise of the nation's sanity. That's why I so passionately believe that the non-aggression, it's not enough to just embrace the non-aggression principle as a principle. I do honestly believe we need to establish it as law through three-part peace agreement that we present so okay so um the way i understand what you're saying correct me if i'm wrong but um the way i understand it is when you say the non-aggression principle should be law um i assume you mean and, and also that everybody has the same rights as we all do right and you know which is actually exactly why we're anarchists because you know it doesn't matter what costume you put on you still are subject to the same laws of morality um so anybody can enforce the non-aggression principle, right? Anybody, um, you know, if you see a robbery, you know, or if you see some kind of violation, you know, um, some kind of enslavement, whatever, that you you are entitled to go in and uh, do what you can, you know, to prevent that or or to or help the person. Um, it, that's kind of what, what I see, and um, and also I think what you're saying, if, if that is true, then what I what I also talk about in my podcast and my videos is a similar thing in that basically um, I tell people that for me, freedom is taking responsibility, hundred percent responsibility for your own actions and understanding that in one sense you can do what you want, but then in the other sense, endure the consequences, accept the consequences of what you do <laughs> without, without complaint, right? Because if you don't understand what common morality is, which is kind of, unusual because most people do you know generally except for some reason they have this idea that the state is the, the giant exception to morality for some reason but aside from that most people do understand common laws of decency civility and morality in, in you know in terms of their fellow human being um and so all we're saying is that accept 100 percent responsibility for your actions because you are you own yourself, you own your body and the, your actions, the the consequences, the effects of your actions, and, of course, the fruits of your labor as well. Um, and so I think, it, it, would you say is, in that is that's kind of what you're saying? Because that's kind of what I yeah. say as well. Is that's, I, I, my, my goal in my show, in my, in my podcast, in my videos, is to basically bring it back to the individual and empower the individual and say, stop looking to politicians 
to do things that you yourself would never do. You yourself would never go to a business, hold them at gunpoint, and rob them because they're using plastic straws, right? <laughs> you yourself would not, <laughs> you know, a person who's smoking a joint in, a base, in the basement by himself would not go to that person, rob them by gunpoint, or arrest them and, and imprison them because they're doing that, right? You yourself wouldn't, wouldn't go to your neighbor and rob them and call property tax to fund your child's education. Nobody would do that, right? So if you yourself wouldn't do it, then you're, you're not taking responsibility, right? And, and so that, I think that's one of our goal, another one of our goals as well as volunteerists is to show people that, you know, what we're advocating is just universal morality, <laughs> you know, the, we're advocating yeah, for principles, principles that are universalizable, right? Go ahead. Yeah, no, that's 100 percent agree. And, and you raise a good point as well about the connection between freedom and responsibility, because that also harkens back to what I was saying. Right. Like, for example, with the, the the difference between the vulnerable child that, um, you know, can't consent to things because they can't take responsibility for themselves. That's why they don't have that freedom. But the adult who does have that freedom also has that responsibility. So, for example, that's why children aren't responsible for themselves to the full extent of, you know, being responsible for a crime in the way that an adult would be. Their guard, their, you know, their guardians, which would normally be their parents, obviously have to take that responsibility for them until they get to an age where they can take that responsibility. And when they, when they've got the moral agency to be able to take that responsibility that's when they can take that full freedom as well. Like the two go hand in hand. Yeah. The freedom to do what you want also includes the responsibility to be responsible for your actions, mm. especially if they're criminal. Right. Um, that's yeah. For me, freedom and responsibility go hand in hand when you're talking about the concepts of the non-aggression principle and, and liberty. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't see much disagreement between the way you present. I mean, you say it in a slightly different way and you present it in a different way. And also, I don't, you know, when I tell people or when they find out that I'm an anarchist, I don't often tell people, they just find out, um, you know, they're like, oh, you want to abolish the government? No, not really. I don't like that phrase because it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like, I mean, I mean, some people draw the analogy of, of, of the state like cancer and we have to excise the tumor, right? And in one way that's true, but in another way it's not true because the state is more, it's like the representation of people's thoughts of their ideas that they need a ruler, right? That this this agency of coercion is legitimate, right? And so the way I look at it, if you, you know, you know, you know, people use this common analogy of if there was a button that would, you know, get rid of all of government completely, would you push it? And I say it wouldn't make a difference because if you do push it and all of, you know, the state disappears somehow, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what happens to the people, <laughs> but if something with the state disappears. People, if they still believe that they need a ruler, that they need a state, they will just recreate another one. You haven't changed the problem. The state is the symptom of the problem. It's not the cause of the illness. <laughs> yeah, know? I'd go along with that. I'd you go know? along with that. I mean, I, I suppose the only um, caveat I'd add to that or just clarification is is that I think the root problem is, as I say, the, the non-aggression principle, I think sits at the root of that problem. Like right. you say, the state is a symptom of that. Right. But the other thing I think that people don't get but need to get with regards to to what the state is, is like, like, for example, when they look at all the things that the state provides and they think, well, we can't have that unless we have a ruling entity. And I'm, they need to be able to divorce the power to rule from the power to serve or the ability to serve or, the, mm. you know, the, uh, um, you know, actually doing it. And, and also, they need to divorce what a ruler is from what a leader is. Because right. that doesn't right. mean we can't still have hierarchies. We can't still right. have leaders. Right. If people want, you know, people don't, um, the way we want to organize, sometimes we do need and want leaders in certain areas and aspects. If that's voluntary, if we're voluntarily following a leader, that's fine. And if people want to organize, um, you know, I mean, for example, one of the ways... Uh, I don't want to jump ahead with regards to the practicalities of, you know, creating a free society. But one of the, 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 the mechanisms that the nation's insanity suggests is like when you establish the non-aggression principles law, the government would become 
almost illegal as a ruling entity. But <laughs> I like that. You sh- but yeah, well, the it state would, is illegal. But, <laughs> but it would still, but everything's still there. You know, all the infrastructure, all the people, yeah. you know, we're all still here. Right. And it's like, so what do we do with that? And it's like, well, we could run it on a voluntary basis. We, you know, it's still there. It, you know, you, you can still have this democratically controlled collective. I mean, I think a lot of stuff needs to be given back because pretty much everything the government has has been stolen. Right. And, and how you would do that is, is obviously a slightly more complicated question, although I, there is an answer presented for that within the nation's sanity as well. But the, the, the basic idea that you that you can still have all the things that government provides in the way of services and what have you without ruling and it's like i say about the non-aggression principle you can still have law you can still enforce the non-aggression principle and protect people from other people and and make sure the 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 criminal elements don't cause harm to the the good decent peaceful people whether it's low-level criminals or giant criminals that want to rule us as governments Mm. we need to be equally vigilant against both i think Mm -hmm. um but the fact of the matter is is you to the power to enforce that doesn't require the power to rule us. And you made a very good point when you said about the fact that anyone can enforce the non-aggression principle. And that's exactly right. The police, if you ha- if say you had a police in a free society, like well, police isn't a very good word for them, but because uh, they'd be unrecognisable from what we have today. Maybe but pr- Private you know, security but, or, or just security? Yeah, well, we're not even private. I mean, I'm, I'm even something that serves the general public. Okay. That's, that's perhaps, you know, the, and there's various ways that you can have that, you know. Okay. Um, so it doesn't even have to be done in that setup, mm-hmm. but it's voluntary. That's that's the point of everything. Right. It's always voluntary. And you can still have like a dip. But what I'm saying is whether it's private or whether it's a public serving um, organization, you can still have a dedicated organization that that you would rather call to deal with a criminal rather than dealing with it yourself because we're not all we all have the same right to deal with criminals and we all have the same right to enforce the non-aggression principle but we don't all have the same ability to so you know some little old lady doesn't she might have the right to go and tackle her mugger but it might be better for you know to have other people do that for her so that, that and that's the point but but to, to do that, to, to offer that service, they don't also need to have the right to, like I say, to rule us and to mm. brutalize us and to right. extort us and right. to coerce us. People need to divorce that. People mm. need to stop thinking that it's either we either have a ruling government or we're all going to live in caves and <laughs> have not. You know what I mean? It's like it doesn't, it's not, that's not the choice. The right. choice is actually we have these things voluntarily or we have them with a gun pointed to our head. Right. That's the real choice. Have you um, have you read the law by Frederick Bastiat? Because I've read some of it because somebody else recommended this to me a little while ago, and this because it does speak very similarly yeah. to a lot of what I'm talking about. Yeah, because your arguments <laughs> remind me a lot of what the way he writes in there, which is ba- one of the quotes is um, so, so, I'm going to paraphrase, but um, you know, socialists believe that if the state doesn't perform an action or doesn't do some to service then it can't be done or it won't be done and, and um you know if like if we object to state-run education we object to education altogether right or and so they believe that you know that if the state doesn't raise grain then you know nobody's gonna eat or something like that <laughs> right so so it's it's uh yeah definitely that idea and that's that's another thing that we have to um you know, help people to understand is um, is that you know the state when when the state does something, it's always funded by taxation, which is yeah, violent extortion, which is theft, robbery, and, and you know, there's so many ways to do things without robbing people. Well, what a bright idea! How about we try? How about we stop robbing people? How about that? And 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 um, you know, and and you know when people try to defend state quote state services which i don't really i i hate calling them state services because it's like saying you know like you know i always make the analogy you know a, a woman uh, you know if, if somebody makes the um what was it like the utilitarian argument right we need the state because we have you know a post office because we have um you know whatever the municipalities right <laughs> it's like it's like that's the utilitarian argument which is like you know a rapist is like well thank god if it wasn't for me you wouldn't have a baby <laughs> right well yeah that's, it's not yeah. about it's not about the end result it's about how did you get there you know did you use immoral means to get there then then it shouldn't have happened you know then it's a crime um and um and so yeah 
helping people getting people to understand that is uh, is definitely definitely a challenge and also if people try to defend state state services or or state products or something i i tell them would you prefer to use the toilet in a public park or the toilet in a mcdonald's <laughs> I mean, I don't go to McDonald's, but I know that they're cleaner than a public toilet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I must admit, I'm not keen on any type of public toilet, but the ones that are by businesses are usually of a higher standard than the ones that are controlled by councils right. and governments. Oh, and, yeah. And what have you. yeah <laughs> by, quite a, by quite a large stretch, yeah. <laughs> and, and when people start to think about that, they're like, oh, no, I would never go to a public toilet. <laughs> <laughs> So, so yeah. So I try to bring I, I try to bring these things, you know, down from the intellectual level and bring it to like reality for them, so they can make a, so they can make a, um, you know, they can identify with it, you know, and and, and yeah, it, it gets it gets real for them. <laughs> yeah, and also like the the utilitarian argument does have value as well. You know, you it, it's not like it's irrelevant. It's just that the principle always comes first, right, and then we, right. I mean, it's like for example, you can. Like with the slavery thing, like you said before, slavery was wrong because it was wrong, not because it was ineffective. Yeah. But you could have, all, but you could also add that argument that also, by the way, this would be more effective actually if you yeah. pay people, you yeah. know, and, and people done it voluntarily and, and mm. you know, etc. But, um, but even without the utilitarian argument, and also it's not ultimately the principle trumps, you know. What's right and wrong always trumps, in my personal opinion. Mm. I think you always have to start with the principle and then go from there. But it is, it is an important point to make, though. It is an important point to make because people that, – that, it is the same argument. When people say, well, who, who – is that old cliche, isn't it, about who will build the roads without the government? Mm. It's the same as who will pick the cotton without the slaves. It's right. like, well, first of all, there is an answer to that question. But second of all, it doesn't matter because it's wrong anyway. And even if we don't have an answer to that question, we still got to abolish this shit because it's wrong. But we also have an answer for it. There is other ways to create roads. There is other ways to pick cotton. And you will actually find that we'll do it much better when we're doing it in a voluntary way. But even if that wasn't the case, even if it's harder to do it voluntarily, we still got to do it that way because anything other than that is a crime. Yeah. Uh, it reminds me of two quotes that I really like. One is uh, Gandhi. Um, he says, "Take care of the means, and the ends will take care of themselves." And and the other one is, um, I think it's um, uh, Pablo Zapata, which is a Mexican revolutionary, um, and he said, um, "I will die a slave of of, uh, of principles, not of men." <laughs> I like that. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, that's that's definitely what I try to talk about as well. That's why when people ask me what I talk about on my podcast, I for, first things I say is philosophy, morality, and economics. You know, those three things. Um and I think that so many confusions can be cleared up when people have a clear understanding of of what they're talking about. What's economics, what's morality, what's philosophy? You know, those three things, so many things can be cleared up in my in my view. Um, and, uh, and so that's why when I, when I talk to somebody who I know, you know, is not on the p same page as me, even disagrees with me vehemently, um, the first thing that we need to establish is basic definitions, right? Because if you try to talk to somebody that's completely on a different wavelength and, and you both think capitalism is a different thing, or, or you both even think coercion is a different thing or taxation is a different thing, you're not going to get anywhere. You're just going to be like missing each other constantly. Um, and it's going to be completely counterproductive, and you're probably going to be shouting at each other, <laughs> and it's probably going to be end, you know, end in anger and all that stuff. So yeah, basic definitions clears up so many things. <laughs> it is, and it is very important as well because I mean, partly because a lot of people go into conversations in bad faith, and there's a lot of intellectual dishonesty. But also, even without that, even even with you know, full sincerity, because you're because. Because everyone's been born into a world where these principles that should be self-evident aren't actually what the, you know the governing principles aren't aren't the things that you know people don't like we say where people haven't thought about whether taxation is theft people haven't even thought outside of you know they all embrace the non-aggression principle in their person-to-person -person lives but for some reason their mind it stops when you get to the government it stops mm. when you get to because it's all they've ever known right. and often 
like you say, democracy, capitalism, these things mean different things to them. Um, and democracy is always considered a, a positive thing and capitalism is always considered a negative thing. Um, and I can understand the reasons for that. Um, I don't have problem with democracy as a tool for decision making within a voluntary system. But democracy <laughs> as a system of rule suffers the same problem as all systems of rule. It's a system of rule yeah. and it's immoral. It's criminal. It's, I mean, it always used to frustrate me how people used to talk about dictatorship and democracy as if they're opposites. Yeah. <laughs> well, democracy is a dictatorship. It's just a dictatorship of the majority right. instead of a dictatorship by a minority, which, right. you know, this, obviously the stereotypical dictatorship is one person. But at the, old, at the end of the day, if you're being ruled, you're being dictated to, whether it's a, mi a majority or a minority, the, cr the crime is still the same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like a, a, another line of, uh, of reasoning I tell people to help, understand to help them understand what what morality is and what i'm talking about is is um you know i say do you use violence to solve problems in your daily life no okay what if you and a friend get together is it okay for you to use the violence no okay is there a number of people where it's okay to use violence to solve your problems no <laughs> ah so it doesn't matter the number the the universal law of morality doesn't change ah what about if we elect a, dick, uh, a politician to do the very same thing. Is it immoral then? <laughs> and, you know, people begin to see the pattern, right? Where does this change along the way? And um, it shouldn't, <laughs> and it doesn't. Um, and so what, what, once people realize that, they're like, huh, all right, all right, I see where you're coming from. <laughs> or, or some other people are like, I know, I know what you're trying to say, and you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what they know you what you're trying to say because their logic has already taken them yeah. there but they don't want to go there no, themselves they even don't. though their mind is like yeah this is true <laughs> they know what you're going to say because they followed it themselves yeah. but um, but yeah I mean people are resistant to it for other reasons often it's not because the logic fails mm. it's not because the principle fails it's because they can't imagine the reality they can't imagine the implications and they can't imagine a world or they can imagine it. And it's horrible things that they're imagining. Like, you know, I mean, particularly the word anarchism, I think that invokes a lot of um, images for a lot of people that yeah, aren't pleasant, right. you know, it, the other it, problem. It, yeah, the other yeah problem. it invokes images of lawlessness and right. burning cars and, right. and you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is funny, this idea that because they can't imagine it, then they must resist it, which is, which is really amusing. Because it's like, do you know how your computer works? <laughs> exactly. Do you know how your car works? Do you know how your cell phone, your smartphone works? <laughs> Yet we <laughs> always use these, you know, no problem using them. You know, why do you need to know how, you know, every every small detail of, of, of society or the economy, how that would work for you to accept that, we don't need a ruling class or a ruling institution, you know, or, or I think it's because all those other things involve going with the flow. And what we're talking about is unfortunately against the flow in regards to what right. the majority right. accepts and believes and preaches. So right. I think that's what it's, I think that's the hardest thing. I think once you get to like that critical mass, if we could ever do that, yeah. uh, that's when the battle's pretty much won because a lot of other people will follow along, even if, whether they understand the principle or not. You know, yeah. so it's um, it's it's one of those issues. I'm, I don't want to sort of sound disparaging to my fellow man or or, <laughs> or anything like that, but a lot of people have a very sheep-like mentality, and they will just sort of rather than think for themselves, just go along with 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 whatever the. With, with, with whatever it is all about and you know that is what it is but i think i think the problem is is i think and again it harkens back to this whole idea of uniting people on the non-aggression principle because i think that is a common ground that you know like i say why don't why i never identified a, or didn't like identifying as an anarcho-capitalist was just because i feel like the capitalist was unnecessarily was an unnecessary aspect that might be divisive to people that have rightly or wrongly you know um the wrong connotations connected to that word and voluntarism i like just because it focuses specifically on what we all should be focusing on and my attitude is is whether you've got um more of a collectivist ideology like 
communist ideals or socialist ideals. If you're coming at it from a voluntary point of view, there's no reason why you shouldn't be united with anarcho-capitalists and people that are more looking at it from a free market point of view. If you're both united on, as voluntarists, then we could be stronger together, you know? Mm. Um, and I just think it's a shame that that's not the case. Um, most of the people that call themselves anarcho-communists I, I, I can't work out how they differ from normal communists because they all advocate pretty much the same thing with regards to seizing private property and right. stuff like that. Right. Like, well, that's that's not voluntary. That's not anarchy. Right. And right. that's that's basically what the state's doing. But you just want to do it under the pretense of the people, which is also what the state does. So, <laughs> you know, it's, right, right, uh, right. it becomes – but if but if there was – um, voluntary versions of that, you know, if there were people that said, well, look, you know, we, because there are flaws, I, I don't, I, I suppose another reason why, even though I do respect a lot of the free market arguments, because, and, and agree with them, because there is a lot the free market can deal with in ways that people don't really appreciate when you get government out of the way. Um, but I don't have, you know, un, unwavering faith that relying on business practices necessarily is always the way to go still has to be voluntary and some people would argue the free market doesn't just involve profit it can involve you know charity is free market and and anything that's voluntary is free market so again it, it depends how people are defining things mm. but often when you're talking to someone who's not of a anarcho-capitalist leaning that's more of a sort of communist persuasion they're just very resistant to the whole idea of markets because they just associate it with greed and profits and exploitation and all the negative connotations mm. that they connect with that. and Although I'm not saying there's no reason why you shouldn't try to educate them on the things that they're not understanding, I think a more important conversation is to say, okay, that's fine. I totally support your pursuit of that, and I'm, I would rather – I think I've, I think it would be better to go the free market way, but I totally support your right to, like say, gather communes together and live in a more socialist style as long as it's voluntary. And that should be our attitude towards pretty much everything, you know, whether it's religious, whether it's cultural, whether it's, you know, down to personal choices, everything. We should literally just have that line that says, well, OK, we might not want to associate with you. You know, we might disagree with you to that degree that we don't want to associate with you. Right. But if you're not violating the non-aggression principle, then you're not committing a crime. So there's no reason for us to use force against you. And that's how everyone can peacefully coexist because we're all too different. We'll never get united on the other stuff. We, you'll never make the world um, um, embrace free market and mm. we probably won't get the world to embrace voluntarism. But that's at least theoretically possible in my mind that we could get it or not the whole world, but enough of the world that we could actually perhaps win the war against the, those that want to rule us, those that want to oppress us. Um, and just one other thing I'd like to say with regards to the distinction, not just between voluntarism and anarcho-capitalism, but voluntarism and any kind of anarchism. I think there's still a slight distinction because, or this is how I'm defining voluntarism, at least as it's represented by the nations of sanity, is anarchism is getting rid of the state and wanting to live free from coercion. Voluntarism is getting rid of the state and making it so the state stays gone and everyone is able to live free from coercion. You know, I don't just ah, want to be free. I like that. I want everyone to be free. <laughs> yeah, and I think if we if we got enough people to unite together and have this peace agreement where we establish the NAP as the terms of peace, which would basically make it the law, then everything else we can work out from there. But once we we need that foundation, if we don't have that foundation, I think everything else is compromised. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned about. Um how people tend to not think for themselves and, and tend to uh, go along with the crowd. And it is very true. And on the one hand, it is discouraging. On the other hand, um, it's not because that means that we as um, you know, volunteers or people promoting um, these principles and this ideology don't necessarily have to convince everybody. <laughs> we, just have to exactly. <laughs> we just have to convince the most vocal of, of the people who um who will begin to um you know make real changes in their lives and then that will ripple out and affect everyone else and and so again that's why every every time every time you know people um ask me you know what daniel what should i do 
I, I, I want to, you know, do something. Should I, um, should I run for, run for office? Should I, you know, what should I do? And, and my, my answer to how do you improve the world? How do you make the world a better place is always start with yourself because it's so easy for people to dictate how other people should live. You know, it's easy for, you know, to look at another person's life and saying, you know, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong, you should do this and this and this, right? And and I, I look at it from the perspective that we're all imperfect and we should all look to ourselves first, <laughs> improve ourselves as human beings, recognize that we have flaws, be humble, and, you know, try to be a good example in your own life and hopefully people will see your life and will want to emulate your life. And to me, that's the best way, um, I think, to create a better world, to improve the world, is is not necessarily, you know, I'm not like actively trying to abolish government. All I'm saying is I live by these principles. This is my philosophy. This is my morality. And I think it's correct. And I'm going to live this way. If you want to join me, join me. <laughs> if you don't, so be it. But But I think... You know these principles are consistent. They're moral, and and they make sense. You know, and and they are they're consistent with the um, with with prosperity, with a, with a free society, with a, with a voluntary society. So I'm going to espouse them. You know, <laughs> till I'm blue in the face. <laughs> so uh, so yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um yeah, I mean I, I do agree with that to a certain extent. I suppose the only bit where I push back a little bit, which is perhaps slightly where we differ a little bit with our approach, is. Although I do, I do think, like outside of the non-aggression principle, then we're free to encourage and discourage people, or not, you know, or, or just lead by example, as you were saying. But I do, I suppose, when it comes to the non-aggression principle and and stepping over that line, that's where I'm not prepared to dis agree to disagree with people. That's mm -hmm. where I'm mm -hmm. kind of like. I'm, you know, it's like when it comes to um, something superficial, like whether you should use drugs or something like that. Um, and someone says, oh, I don't agree with it. And someone says, oh, I do. And I'm like, OK, well, these are your voluntary choices. You can agree to disagree and we right. can encourage or discourage behaviors that we disapprove of. Right. But when you start dealing with crime, that's when I'm like. Okay, well, I'm not just going to agree to disagree. I'm not going to just say I'm living my way. You're living yours. Right. You're, uh, this is the line you're crossing where I or anyone else can and should use force to stop you from doing what you're doing because you're you're violating somebody else. You're mm. you're you're committing you're committing a crime in 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 an objective sense. And mm. I suppose that's why. I mean, it's the only real difference I have from from other voluntarists, and it's the only real way that nations of sanity differs from other um, representations of voluntarism. It's just taking that next step of actually establishing it as law so for everybody mm. that's one rule that everyone has to obey mm. and outside of that then we can all be different and we can all associate or disassociate as we please but that's one area where it's like no i don't care you know um whether you're affecting me you're affecting somebody else you know it's it's i think it's just a way of and also, if we did it, if we established it as law, and we did it through the peace agreement, and sorry, can I just quickly, because obviously I know you know about the peace agreement, but obviously anyone listening to this probably wouldn't know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But the, 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 the nation, just for anyone listening, the Nations of Sanity proposes establishing the non-aggression principle as law through a peace agreement that's three parts. And the three part is basically part one is just the basic agreement to establish the NAPA's law. Part two is to set the what I call the lines in the sand, which is these limits of tolerance over the differing interpretations that we spoke about earlier. And then part three is agreeing rightful ownership because property rights isn't much good if people don't agree who owns what. Um, and then once you have those three things in place, then the non-aggression principle is established as the terms of peace, which, as I say, basically makes it the law. And those standards apply to everybody equally. So I often say to people... If do you believe in equal rights, not equal outcome, equal rights? Yeah. And most people will say yes, unless they're some kind of sociopath. And <laughs> then, and then I just turn around and say, well, if you step back and think about it, but our claim is that the only way, literally the only way, you can have equal rights under the law is if the law is the non-aggression principle, because that's the only standard that you can apply a hundred percent equally right. to everybody. Right. You know what I mean? Right. As soon as you step out that standard then it's unequal but that's 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 literally yeah. almost as a mathematical certainty and that's 
that's why I think that even though it's it might seem like a small detail, I think it's so vitally important, and I do think it's something that um, that's missing in the volunteerism movement. Yeah. Well said. Well, well, I think uh, we'll end it there, but I really enjoy the conversation. Uh, Matt, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Um, so please, everyone, uh, check out. Well, actually, before we finish up, um, I always ask, um, <laughs> I'm sure you're familiar, um, my guest for a quote, their, your favorite quote of all time. What would you say, Matt? Do you know what? I've watched enough of your shows that I should have actually been prepared for that question, and I'm not. <laughs> in the slightest. Caught you off guard. You Caught you off guard. Why, why didn't I come up with something? Um, I'm gonna have to think of something off the top of my head. Um, don't let it pass you by. That always sticks out to me. Ah, so now what? What? Uh, like, what do you think of when you when you hear those words? What, what do you think of? Like you, um, think, like you think of opportunities? Well, yeah, kind of. I mean, life is an opportunity, isn't it? Okay. And I suppose it's about, I mean, someone, someone close, I mean, Don't Let It Pass Me By is, is actually a, a song lyric from a song. But ah. um, Which song, but, do you know? Uh, so UB40 song, I think it's called Don't Let It Pass You By. Ah, <laughs> I think that's I see, the I title see. of the song. Okay. Um, but um, someone very close to me said to me, something very similar to that in regards to, you know, don't, don't just let life, you know, go by and, you know, life, life's about living and taking uh, and seeing and, and um, that kind of sentiment. So yeah, that's something that, uh, that I suppose is, is meaningful to me. So. That, that reminds me of another quote. I forget who said it. I want to say something like Ralph Waldo Emerson or Bertrand Russell, one of those philosophers. Uh, they said, most people, Miss opportunity because it's dressed in overalls and has work boots on. <laughs> <laughs> right? Everybody wants the opportunities, but nobody's willing to do put put in the work for it. Right? <clears throat> yeah. And also, and also equally true to that metaphor is they don't always recognize the opportunity. Yeah. Right. As an opportunity. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah, also it might look like too much like hard work for a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> That's always going to put you off. Isn't it? <laughs> work? What? <laughs> like, uh, like people will say, "Oh my God, this this band they came out of nowhere. Wow, it must be an overnight sensation." And, and then the uh, the joke is, "Yeah, they're they're a ten year overnight sensation, <laughs> <laughs> right? Nobody nobody recognizes all the years of hard work and practice, and you know nobody cares then." But when you make it big, then that's when people care about you, right? So, yeah. Yeah, I've got a friend of mine who who's um, quite a successful businessman, and he always um, doesn't like it when people say how lucky he is because obviously he appreciates <laughs> right. that he's very fortunate in many ways, and and there, obviously luck plays a part in everything. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. he always feels that it takes away from the fact that he had to work his absolute ass off to get exactly. where he wants. So, exactly. Um, so you know, so perhaps. You know, luck might play a part, but also so does effort and endeavor and right. and things like that. So. And 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 to go along with that, uh, what you just said, I'm I'm a a big piano player and a big chess player. And when people see me play piano, like, oh wow, you're so talented. That's wonderful. I'm like, again, you know, it's like talent to me is like you were born with it. Whereas whereas the way I look at it, it's like it's like you know maybe five percent talent and ninety five percent practice and hard work. Like I practiced a lot. A lot of practice, yeah. hours and hours and hours and hours. Um, you know, preferring to practice instead of like go out with my friends. I was like, I wasn't really a, that kind of kid. Um, and yeah, same thing with chess. A lot of reading books and you know, playing online, playing people, and just you know, practice, practice, practice. That's how you get better. You know, it's like there's no shortcuts. There's no shortcuts. Yeah, in life, but you definitely. Know? I mean, people are <laughs> born with. You might be born with a better aptitude for certain things. Maybe but right. If you right. don't put the work in, then it means nothing. Goes to waste. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Well, awesome, awesome conversation, Matt. Really enjoyed it. Uh, so please check out his website. I mean, actually, you know what? Why don't you um, uh, reiterate your your contact information if people want to uh, follow your work? Okay. Um, yeah. Well, the the main website is um, nationsofsanity.com. Um, there's a Facebook page of the same name and a Twitter account of the same name, and you can get links to those from the website. And there is also a YouTube channel, again, of the same name, Nations of Sanity. Um, and again, that is also linked. You can get linked to everything else from the website. So the website's always a good starting point for people. Um, if anybody wants to contact me, they can contact me through the Facebook page um, or the website or the Twitter, um, whichever they prefer, or putting a comment on YouTube. I, I try to check them all semi-regularly. So, uh, so yeah. 
Yes, please, uh, you know, engage with Matt um, through Facebook, through Twitter, through uh, through YouTube. Um, I think he's doing wonderful work for um, for volunteerism and spreading these principles of non-aggression and property rights and self-ownership. And I think he's going doing a wonderful job. You know, we all approach this um, this idea a little bit differently, but I think uh, for the most part, we all agree about this philosophy and about what the problem is. And so, um, so yeah, check him out and uh, engage. So uh, thanks a lot for listening. This is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on theconsciousresistance.com and solpodcast.org. Wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it, please feel free to donate and help me interview other fascinating people. You can do so through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peacefulanarchism to help me out. A dollar a show is all I ask. If you feel so inclined to donate more, please feel free. It will only assist me in spreading the message of freedom and volunteerism that much farther and that much more efficiently. You can also donate to my Bitcoin. My Bitcoin address is in the description to my videos as well as on my website, peacefulanarchism.com. And while you're on my site, there's a donate button to donate through PayPal. If you prefer to donate through PayPal, you can do so with that. But Patreon is a little bit easier for content creators as you can set up a recurring donation if you so desire. Also, while you're on my website, peacefulanarchism.com, please feel free to sign up, enter your email address, sign up for my newsletter, and you'll receive updates every time I post something, a video or an interview. I do not send out any spam. Or you can also follow me on Facebook under facebook.com slash peaceful anarchism or facebook.com slash Danilo Cuellar 3, I believe. Danilo Cuellar 3. So either, either one of those methods, if you are able to donate, I would be most appreciative. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a magnificent day. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government control 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.